Ladies and gentlemen, join us tonight, Jeffrey Tucker of Laissez Fair Books, and he is the author of a, a new story out, um, Four Signs of the Collapsing State. Mr. Tucker, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Adam, it's really always a pleasure to be here. So a lot of people would see this as kind of a depressing subject, four signs of a collapsing state. Why didn't you call it four signs of a, of a, of a rising free society? Well, mainly because the theory I was working from is a theory about where the state comes from. Uh, the assumption here, and it's, and it's from a, a book by Hans Hermann Hoppe, is that in a, in, a, in a state of nature, which means like a world without technology and economics and, you know, all the stuff you see around you, capital and whatever, that nobody would normally ever create a state because it's kind of stupid. You know, like just to hand over <laughs> your weapons to a handful of guys and tell them, well, here's, here's you, you make the laws, you tell us what to do, you take from us what you want to do, and we'll trust you to make us you know, safe and prosperous. I mean, this is just a kind of a stupid thing. Nobody would ever do this. So he <laughs> seeks to explain why the state exists. And his fundamental reason is propaganda, that they, they, they convince you that, uh, that, it's good, that it's good for you, that the state brings about, you know, good things. And in order to do this, he says there has to be four institutions that the state fundamentally controls. And it's communication, education, money, and... The security apparatus. But it seems like the government's got a pretty good grasp on those things, wouldn't you say? Well, you know, I, one of the things that I, I like to always compare, this, this article is taking a broad view, 20, 30 years, you know. Um, I like to compare uh, our times to, say, the 1930s or the 1940s, you know, which we weren't around. But one thing that's really fun is to go through and look at uh, propaganda videos and, and YouTube and see what the ethos was at the time. Um, you know, I mean, it's shocking, really, uh, the extent to which the state just had a kind of a firm grip on all those institutions, communication. I mean, there were, you know, government mails and the government assigned telephones, you know, but that was pretty much it. And then, um, you know, money, there was, I mean, there was a whole theory developed that you uh, assign uh, scientific economists to be in charge of the central bank and they can kind of manipulate unemployment. You know, it goes this way, it goes that way. They, through, by manipulating the money, you can, you can create this kind of macro, scientific macroeconomic planning. And education was, there was no such thing as homeschool. There was no, I mean, there was no internet, right? And um, then in security, I mean, the private arbitration didn't exist. Uh, the, the, the police were widely considered to be part of the civilian order, you know, just nice guys like your next door neighbor, you know, they're there to protect you. So it was a different world. And you have to sort of know something about that world to measure it against our own world. And, and as I was reading Hoppe, I realized, wow, you know, two of these institutions have completely collapsed, the communication monopoly and the education monopoly. And money is seriously under strain, more so like every day, and it's very exciting. And the security element, uh, private arbitration is used by almost all businesses. Nowadays, people mostly think of the cops as being not on their side, but on the side of the powers that be, the glorified tax collection agencies at best, right? And uh, uh, so everything's come under question and either co collapse completely or come under serious question uh, in our times. And what it tells me is that these four fundamental institutions that sustain statism are kind of cracking and, and crumbling. So that, that's what my article was about. Well, hold on. I want to step back to the, this assessment that you've got of these four institutions, because you, you see that a lot of people could look at this and go, well, no, education. The government has more control over education as a whole than ever before. They're spending more money. They're controlling more resources. They're exercising influence from, from, a, from a lower level than ever before to a higher level than ever before. Communication, the, although the Internet is exploding, the government is, is right there on its heels with CISPA now making a comeback in Congress. Money, the government is able to create more exploitation than ever before through money. And security, the security state, has never been more intrusive, has never been more pervasive. And still, the, you know, the numbers of the, the percentage of the population that's engaged and employed by the security state is pretty damn high. Now, if you, if you are able to look at these dynamics from a libertarian perspective, from, from your voluntarist understanding of, of the nature of government, 
yes, you have to see their true purposes, but most libertarians who see that would would probably disagree with at least right away with your your assessment that these things are crumbling. Does, does the libertarian perspective also suggest then a, a similarly radically different view of just the current state of reality, not just the rather than the the ideal that that libertarians seem to share? Well, I mean, to me, all those things you describe are the behaviors of a cornered rat, essentially. <laughs> I mean, the state is, is, is bad, the state is mean, and it's never going to be nice, and it's never going to back off. In fact, the, 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 the more it's under strain, the more it's under pressure, the meaner and more wicked it gets. I mean, you look back at, like, if you talk to a, a Russian that was alive in, like, 1987 and 1988, they will, tell, they will tell you that there was no perestroika or glossness as far as they could tell. The state was ever more pervasive, that it was... It was cracking down on liquor consumption, uh, t uh, collection of taxes, uh, you know, trying to make the status system work uh, more intensely than ever. It's, it's kind of a myth that Gorbachev sort of liberalized the economy. It's not, it's not really true. What, what happened is he ramped everything up to the breaking point, you know. And once, it, this, Adam, this is the key thing, that at some point he ramped it up so far that that it was unsustainable anymore, and there was a displacement that occurred because there had already developed an, at the core of Russian society an, an infrastructure of civil society that had grown out of, you know, the black markets, uh, uh, human associations that had developed, and people had, had already dislodged themselves of that sort of ideological attachment to the regime. So it, it, it just, just a few buttons, and mostly it was the crackdown on alcohol that did it, and people said, okay, that, that's enough. You know, so, I mean, that's the way revolutions happen. You, you build up a, a gigantic alternative infrastructure that's m more performatively impressive mm -hmm. and serves human needs better than the state. And then the state ramps it up its enforcement and, and eventually, you know, it, everything just turns. Well, let's look at these one at a time then in terms of the trends that we're seeing today and what they become, because it's easy to say it, it should be like this in the future or it could be like this in the future but if you don't have any current trends to back it up uh, you know I, I i would be very skeptical so education we see the rise of homeschooling we see the rise of the internet what does the world look like then what is the implication for the government education racket as it's i mean you could say already just by the khan academy and so many other online resources yeah. really rendered obsolete yeah, well, th th these things, we need to appreciate just how radical these systems are. I mean, the fact that you can basically go from, you know, early age until, uh, uh, you know, PhD level studies uh, sitting at a laptop, you know, was, was unthinkable in the past. But, you know, there's other things, too. I've, I've never been a big proponent of, like, charter schools, for example. But if you look at them, they represent a kind of concession. Well, that the state system yeah, is not why, why not? Aren't charter schools a step forward or a step in the right direction? Well, I see, I, I didn't used to think so, but I'm just, I'm just saying that when you look at them, they represent a serious concession that something's wrong with the, with the current order. There's another thing, Adam, that you, you look at, once you look at the way public schools function, uh, particularly at the secondary level in this country, there's a huge infusion of private energy and private money that's going into them to make them work in their sports programs and the music programs and everything about them, uh, parental energy involved. And this is not really the state so much anymore. Um, the other thing is that, that the funding of the public schools is wasteful and absurd and ridiculous as it is, is very much tied to sort of property ownership and, and uh, property taxation in neighborhoods in which you live. So it's not quite the same thing as the central plan. And despite Washington's you know, a, a ridiculous, you know, one child left behind and all this. I mean, in the end, what goes on in the classroom is up to, you know, what goes on in the classroom. I mean, this, the, the federal government causes a lot of terrible things to happen. But in the end, I don't see the public school monopoly as being as, uh, I mean, it's nothing like what, for example, the founders of the late 19th century imagined it. I mean, <laughs> here's the other thing. You know, I mean, I, I mean, nobody believes this stuff anymore. I mean, the drug war propaganda in the public schools, it has exactly the reverse effect. 
you know, when the cops come in and say, don't use drugs. <laughs> you know, they, they, they hurt you. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't actually, did, did I just go off camera? Wait, wait, the, uh, no, the, the when, when, when I was told in middle school that, that drugs are bad and, and I should never do drugs, I mean, that, that worked perfectly for me. I never did a drug for the for rest of my entire life. I mean, it was, Adam, it was that perfect. is so great. I'm glad to hear that you're a man of, of high uh, <laughs> virtue. That's extraordinary. No, you no, know, no, I'm uh, of low I'm, virtue. I'm, a, I'm an obedient slave. <laughs> yeah. You know, I've never actually told this story in print, but, you know, I, when I was in public school, I remember the, um, none of us knew anything about drugs except there was like, you know, one or two druggies in the, in the class, and we all kind of knew that they, you know, did drugs. We didn't know what that meant, right? But, and so the policeman came into the room and he said, I'm here to give you a talk about drugs. And um, he held up his charts, you know, and like he had this, this framed picture of, uh, of, of, of pot, you know, like joints rolled up. And they're all different colors. There's like red, there's blue, there's green, whatever. And he says, now this is what's called marijuana, sometimes called a reefer, a joint, a Mary Jane. You know, he's going through this whole, you know, whatever, this long list. And we're all very impressed by this, you know. And so suddenly we're looking back at this pothead, you know, in the back of the room. And he's over there kind of going, he has this knowing look like, oh, yeah, <laughs> I know all this stuff. You know? And we're kind of like impressed, you know, like, whoa, hey, that's, that's a pretty cool guy. <laughs> you know? And so then goes on to the harder stuff. And now we're going to you know, talk about, I, I forget now what the dr popular drugs were at the time, but every drug that he mentioned, this cool guy in the back, he would like, oh, yeah, done that, done that, done that, check, yeah. check, check. And we're all like blown away, right? We're very impressed by this guy that uh, he knew all this stuff. So then the cop leaves, and everybody's surrounding this kid now for the first time. He's got, like, high status that he never had before. You know, he used to be, like, this isolated person nobody wanted to be around. Now everybody wanted to be his friend, you know? <laughs> mm hmm You know, it had the, like, exact reverse effect. Anyway. Um, <laughs> and so and I'm assuming that that crap's still going on. Now, actually, um, now when you walk into the public schools, you know, they put a sticker on you that says, proud to be drug-free or something like that, and the kid's like, uh... I never signed up for this, you know. They just get on you anyway, you know, whatever. Uh, but it's not working. I mean, you look at the founders of the public school system in the late 19th century, you know, they had this goal. I mean, it's just weird that they were going to drag everybody in, this, in these prison sort of situations and, and, and make their – and purge them of all their, you know, ethnic religions and weird attachments to, to home and family and strange far-flung ideologies and make them all into these kind of docile – uh, obedient, uh, civic-loving, uh, re religious devotees of the state. And I just don't see that. I mean, I don't, it seems to me that it hasn't worked at all. In fact, it's working less, working less and less every day. I mean, who actually takes this crap seriously? I mean, the pledge? And, and, the, days, and the turning and people, point was the breakfast club, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something like that. I mean, there was definitely a turning point. And I'm not saying that, like, you know, public school kids are all becoming libertarians. I'm just saying that the system has not turned out to be the way the state set it up to be. I mean, there's a lot of leakage in this system, you know? The grip is slipping. Okay, communication. Yeah, now that's a very interesting one because, uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago that, you know, the post office had a complete monopoly. By the way, um, Adam, you're kind of probably like me in a sense that you want to find things about the left that you, you like. You know, I like to go to left-wing sites and, and find good things, you know. Well, I was just <laughs> over there at alternate.org, and they have this big defense of the hobby. post office. Oh, the great post office, and the government's great, and the people that want to hurt the post office are evil, you know. I'm reading this thinking, this is just pathetic. I mean, who's going to defend the post office these days? And they're cutting Saturday delivery. I mean, this whole <laughs> thing is like this antique not even medieval, you know, institution. It's, it goes, you know, it's, it's just a absurd anachronism. Uh, so communication, I would say, is one that we have completely won in ways that, I mean, there's no way the state would have ever allowed the Internet to be privatized so they knew what would, what would develop after that. So communication, I would say, is just completely gone. Well, I guess you when, you compare, when, you, cause when you compare the Internet to, say, telephones or cell phone technology... <laughs> You might think that the impact is lessened because the government gets to exert more specific influence on the Internet than on individuals' phone conversations. But if you take a full step back, I suppose, as you're, you're saying, in the historical context, and you add in the Postal Service as, as what was a, a, at one time a much greater monopoly on communications because 
postal communication represented such a great share of all human communications or, you know, a, a, a much greater share. It's, it's, it's insignificant now by comparison. Yeah, and, 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 you know, you think back in the New Deal times that everybody hunkered down by the radio to hear what the president had to say. I mean, that was all they knew. They knew what people said around them, and then they knew what the president was saying over the radio. And then otherwise there was some jazz music or something, you know, some big band music. I mean, that was the extent of it. I mean, this is, this is the world of darkness. You know, this is, this is the true dark ages. Uh, it's just pathetic. I mean, we would never tolerate that now. I mean, we, none of us would ever tolerate any rollback and, and what we know. And that's what we all do all day long. And this is the whole human population is like this now, at least half of it or more than half. Wanting to know more all the time and we have the means to discover it uh, like we've never had before. And it's just, I think it's too easy to take all this for granted in a way. I mean, and, and, and we have to understand the significance of it. If it's true that the state is sustained by propaganda and which penetrates what people believe and therefore must control what, what information is out there, and thus we have a long history of censorship and all the rest of it, and I really believe that is true, then the breakdown of this system has to weaken the fundamental apparatus of power in ways that maybe you can't immediately detect from the headlines, but you step back from it and you can see that it's not as nearly like what it once was. And you can also see the direction it's going. Now, money, I want to hear you make the case because I'm certainly a big supporter of, you know, competing currencies, independent yeah. free market currencies. We see the rise of bitcoins, people yeah. trading in gold and silver. But would you really say that the government is, is already losing its grip when it comes well, to the fiat currency Yeah, scams? so this is brand new, though, Adam. This is really since 2008. Okay. And you look at the objectives of the central bank. I believe that Bernanke probably tried to manufacture a dramatic inflation. Uh, I mean, in the sense that it would manifest itself in, in prices. But the problem was that, the, that he had an even greater priority of keeping the banking system solvent and keeping it from completely crashing. So the monetary policy that he undertook uh, created vast amounts of like fake uh, capital, fake reserves, to plug all the holes in the system, recapitalize the banks to get them to uh, adhere to Basel III uh, regulations. But the, the whole system has be, become so risk averse that uh, the velocity of money has absolutely collapsed. Banks are not lending like they once were. In fact, they're not really banks like they used to be at all. I mean, our world today, Adam, in terms of money and banking, is completely different from what it was 10 years ago. It's a totally different world. In fact... So are you making the case that because the landscape has changed from the perspective of the bank as a lender that the yeah. influence on the economy that is exerted by yeah. the monetary system from the Federal Reserve down to the individual banks is actually less than it has been up, far, up far to that, 2008? They don't, they, don't, they don't control it anymore because the, the banks are the institutions that create the money. It's not, I mean, the Fed can creates money for the, for the banks, but in order for the, the money to become hot and you know, become you know, something we use on in the street. circulation. The, yeah, the banks, the banks have to have a, a, a functioning and workable loan system. And that is no longer true. The whole system has been broken down. Now, people still need loans, and there are still, the credit systems are still functioning. But here's what I find most interesting about this. And I, I've heard very little commentary about this. We have two parallel sets of yield curves operating in this country. One is official. And you see it in the official yield curve and how it expresses itself in, in maturities on government, government debt. And then you have a separate sort of private, independent free market yield curve that, that you can see working itself out in things like, you know, uh, credit cards or non-bank lenders and, you know, the regular credit markets that people use outside of the banking system. And there you see a completely different uh, free market rate of interest. So you've got like two parallel systems. This was not true um, even 10 years ago. So that, this is very much like what you see in the third world where you have like an official exchange rate and an unofficial exchange rate, you know, right. or like a market exchange rate. Yep. We, we have the same thing going on right here in this country. We have an official yield curve and an unofficial yield curve. And they've completely separated itself. This is not anything Bernanke like chose. 
But it was forced on him in order to keep the banking system solvent. He chose to protect all the insiders that are expense, of course, um, uh, rather than, rather than, I'm having to fire up my screen here, rather than uh, uh, achieve the secondary objective, which was to manufacture this vast in inflationary credit expansion. Now, under the old definition of inflation, we have plenty of it. But under the most common uh, use of the term, we don't see it in, uh, in terms of the expansion of the money supply. It's just, there's just not enough to fire off that kind of level of inflation that would actually um, uh, cause uh, debts to the government debts to disappear and to do what they, in a Keynesian sense, you know, uh, what they wanted to do, which is inspire lots of new, you know, uh, uh, business startups that hire new people and all, all the things that Keynesians believe that money expansion is supposed to do, it's not doing. And that's because the whole system is broken down. Now, here's the thing. Uh, people like you and me and everybody else in the world, we're not going to sit by and just watch our systems break down. We're going to invent new ways to exchange. And that's what we're seeing right now. You mentioned Bitcoin, but that's just the, that just scratches the surface. We're seeing alternative monies pop up all over the place. Um, well, what I want to ask you about in, in that sense is more what are the mechanisms that not necessarily the currencies, because we know the currency is going to be something else, and it's it's almost speculative to try to say it's it's going to be this or that. Uh, you know, we can pretty well predict that it's going to have to be in order to be competitive, digitizable. You know, something that you can have very easily uh, transferred from from a, your cell phone or a device that you have in your body. This is where I'm I'm pro RFID chip. I don't want a cell phone. I want I want a digital wallet in my fingertip that I can swipe on stuff to pay for things. Like, I, you know, the, the technology itself is not the problem. It's the government controlling it. But, Jeff, when, when we look forward and we see, you know, trends today that determine what we're expecting to see in terms of mechanisms of who controls capital and the way that banks control the creation of loans, what, you know, what kinds of trends do you see today that you think are going to define that new, I, I don't know, for lack of a better term, dynamics of the financial industry. And let me just give out one ex or a couple examples and, and see if you, if you agree that, that these are trends we can see, uh, you know, going into, into, you know, continuing. But like the idea of, of micro loans, the, the, there are institutions set up to start not small businesses, but individuals acting as businesses to support people in that. Um, you know, are we going to see new institutions or more institutions set up that are, that are going to alter the borrowing landscape for people as, as you know, the, from the very most impoverished individuals? And then, you know, the digitization that we see with Bitcoin. I don't mean to, to go back to that, but that we're going to have currencies that are anonymous and encrypted and, and completely digitizable. How does that change the landscape? Yeah, well, peer-to-peer -peer lending is very exciting to me. I mean, you can get a far higher return from peer-to-peer -peer lending. Kickstarter, right? Indiegogo, those kinds of things. Yeah, and, and also, um, well, peer-to-peer -peer lending, like, uh, what is that? What is that? Lending tree, for mm. example. I mean, you and I can, can, can find people to, to loan money to and get a, a very high rate of return. I forget what their latest numbers are. It's between 7 and 10 percent, something like that, you know, on, on uh, direct lending outside the banking system, which is great. This is illegal in some countries. It's not illegal here, fortunately. Uh, and, then, and then you have weird things going on, you know, uh, Adam. It's very interesting to me. You know, 10 years ago, if you had $500 in cash, you wouldn't really know what to do with it, really. I mean, you could spend it. But if you wanted to convert it into a card that you could use to rent a car or check into a hotel or buy something online, mm -hmm. you, you really didn't have a way to do that. But maybe you've noticed that <laughs> now there's a very easy way to do that. You can anonymously convert that cash into uh, a, a, a debit card at Walmart or any, any CVS store. I mean, any store like down the street. This is an ex I mean, I don't know why I've hardly seen any comment about this. This is an extraordinary thing that's happened. I mean, we have, like, the market has created an amazing mechanism for uh, a certain level of financial independence that wasn't even available, if you know what I mean by that, yes. um, that wasn't even available to people uh, five or ten years ago. I mean, this is the kind of 
thing that's going on. Um, I also, I wouldn't discount uh, precious metals in this respect either, because um, you know, at the crisis uh, in at the um, hurricane last year, or it was last November, I guess, in the Northeast. I forget what was the name of that hurricane that came through. Hurricane Sandy, Sandy I think it was. Yeah, Sandy. There were a lot of bid ask offers online being made for gasoline in mm-hmm. gold and in silver. So and um, in sex. Yeah, and sex. That's cool. Right. In New I York. Mean, there yeah. were there were I, I don't I saw I think that the headlines were not about people offering gold and silver for gas. It was it was people offering sexual favors for gas in, in <laughs> that, New that York really City. That really happened. It really did happen. Craigslist, there, are baby. Of, there are a lot of these systems <laughs> that are being created. Uh, the other thing is the invention of these discount cards. You know, we, we 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 need to sort of think about the significance of this. It used to be like you would get a discount card like Chili's, you know, or something like that. Now you buy them for for any and all stores and and places are creating their own currencies like I think just last week Amazon introduced a new Amazon coin. So this is a very interesting thing because it's going to become a kind of an alternative mon- monetary system. So if you publish a book, you can get paid in Amazon coins and then spend those an- Amazon coins on products in Amazon. I mean, that's a lot of indirect monetary exchange that has no, it's never converted into dollars at all. I mean, it's converted straight into, into Amazon coins. And, I mean, that's a very, I mean, if you watch these trends carefully, wh- what you observe is the creation of a kind of a parallel um, a private monetary system that, again, was unthinkable uh, in the past. And this is, we're just at the beginnings of this. And well, I well, think the reason is that it's, it's, a, it's a strange reason. The, the money and banking system that the, that the state used to control and brag about and use for its own benefit is not working like it used to. Uh, the other thing is that the costs are too high for using that system exclusively. So if people can find another way around it that's you know, rel- relatively safe, then there's a very strong incentive to do that. And private, private markets are not going to sit back and let you know, their systems be destroyed. They will invent new things. And, and you have to look and watch carefully to see the way it's happening. But it is happening. Well, it seems like the other implication of this is not just that there are these new mechanisms uh, occurring, but that a lot of them also provide a way for these transactions to happen outside of the purview of government altogether. Even if they're happening in things that are dollar denominated, they're not subject to taxation, that's a big factor. I mean, that's, that's the obvious huge thing. I mean, everybody wants to get out of the government money so they can, you know, not, not be looted, you know, which is, in effect, what always goes on with, with government. So money. here's the challenge, though. Security, the fourth sign of a collapsing state. Right. Are, are, are you really going to make the case? I mean, I know that the, you know, defense budget... Is uh, is is being threatened now, and I know that the numbers of the Marine Corps are coming down at least by twenty thousand active duty troops, but the DHS, the DSA is still hiring molesters. The Border Patrol is still going strong, hundred mile uh, area of of radius from the border within the United States where the Constitution doesn't apply. How can you tell me that the government is losing its grip on the well, institution of security? I would say that here, and, and in security, he includes not just, not just police and, and military, but also things like the courts and the jails. And, and you could observe, yeah, the jails are more full than they've, they've, they've ever been. But, but I think what matters here, and this is a really decisive change that, that has happened in, in my adult life, is that... The perception of this apparatus has completely shifted. It used to be the case, and it wasn't that long ago, basically it was before 9-11, really, when most people thought of the security apparatus as being part of the civilian order. You know, that was like an extension of you and me. Now it's more decisively apparent that, that the security apparatus is sides with the state against the rest of the population. Mm. And that change in perception is extremely significant Mm. because we have a clearer view of who the friends and who the enemies are than we've ever had before. That's, that's, 
that's very that's a very important shift because it's it's critical for the state to always sell its security apparatus as a service and you you get this mm. all the time like when you're in the line at the TSA you know about to be scanned you know they're they're like well we're doing this because we, because we want to serve you we're i mean we're 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 investigating you and stealing your stuff and and rifling through your bags as a service to you. And we all just stand by and go, that's the stupidest bunch of crap I've ever heard in my life, right? I mean, everybody does that. But the point is, the state wants us to believe that, that the security apparatus is an extension of us. It's something that we would choose and we have chosen. And that's no longer true. I mean, it's even true in the perception of the local police. And, and that has absolutely changed. And, and in the last, in, in my adult life, I mean, you know, over the last 10 years, where most people used to sort of more or less think of the state, the police apparatus as their friend. Now, nobody wants to get mixed up in this stuff anymore. And that is a complete contrast. And it's significant because we have to get clarity on this great dividing line between us and them before we can really uh, see history unfold the way that you and I hope it should. Well, Jeff, unsurprisingly, we have a couple of listeners that want to talk to you. If you want to get in the queue here by Skype, send me a chat at avtm.live on Skype, and uh, we, we'll be taking some questions from the chat as well. But first, we go to Vince in Canada. We're going to get him on the line. Um, Daryl, do you have any... Uh, oh, see, we got. All right, we got Vince here. Vince, you're on the air with Jeffrey Tucker. Welcome to the show. Vince, can we, we can't, are we getting, um, should we test the output from this computer and make sure it was, it was working for the ring, right? Hey, um, you're getting the, oh, now the speakers are off again. Excuse me? me. Vince, you're on the air. Go ahead. What's on your mind tonight? Oh, you hear me now? It's good? Yep. Go ahead, please. Okay. So Jeff, I want to thank you for what you are and what you do, like everything you taught me through the, through, through time. Like, I just want to say, like, I, I've studied in uh, business management, and I have a few economic class, and I thought I knew what economics was, but then I learned about Mises Institute and everything, and now I, I really can't tell that I really know what it, economic was. Like, before it was, like, I, I knew economic, like, I thought it was just, like, managing money, but I knew nothing about money, and I really thank you for that. And from like what I remember from you is like you, you had an obsession which was um, intellectual property. So I wanted to ask you like what you think about the big Ron Paul uh, debate because a lot of people <laughs> think it's about intellectual property, but I don't know. I think it's part of a licensing thing. So what's what do you think about that? You know, v hold on before before we let Jeff come in on this question, we just have to set this topic up properly one more time. Because I actually wanted, this is really the original subject that we wanted to have Jeff on to talk about. And we got to cover it very thoroughly with his recommended guest, Stefan Kinsella, a, a real intellectual property heavyweight, uh, last night. And Jeff, I, was, I swear to God, I was totally going to let this one slide. Vince did not say in the chat that he was going to ask the question. I wasn't even going to let it come up because you are so passionate about this. And I know that if we, if we talked about it for the entire interview, you might, um, I don't know, Say something that, that where, where your passions would get the best of you, but please don't don't hold back now that uh, Vince from yeah. Canada at least well, has put you yeah, on the spot. Yeah, let me just address this. It's funny this this word licensing. I mean, you know, Icon was created by the U.S. Department of Commerce because there was a problem in the early age of the internet that uh, there was a perception that well, the the roots of the internet had landed in the U.S. and that was a that was a serious problem, political problem for the U.S. for a global institution to be basically controlled by the, the global superpower. So the the U.S. Department of Commerce created ICON as a way of kind of decentralizing this or or sloughing it off on the on the U.N. It used to be a private nonprofit uh, thing, uh, but uh, then it was it became a government creation with the Department of Commerce. Got all the big players signed on to it. As part of this new creation, there was um, uh, new contracts. Well, I mean, the the largest players, the big corporate players, wanted this um, uh, domain. They wanted they wanted to be able to come in and seize domains whenever they wanted to. Uh, you know, basically to use their their power to 
to steal other people's uh, property. So that if if you register a domain, it wouldn't be your private property as such. It would always be contingent upon if somebody else really wanted it and they had a good reason, they could rob you of it. Well, this is all a government system that was basically set up to de de defend, you know, fascistic corporate uh, elites, you know. And we had no choice in it, of course, any more than... And, and so to call... You know, your ownership over a domain, a license, is a little bit like saying, well, damn it, you live in the United States. You've signed a social contract. You've got to pay your taxes and obey all the, all the rules and all the regulations of our, of, our, of our society. You know, I mean, that's, that's not really a, a I mean, it's like saying, well, you don't, have natural, you don't have human rights. You only have a license that the government grants you. You know, so you shouldn't really compl complain about anything. Why so is this? Yeah, why is this a big deal, though? Why why should we even care about it, Mr. Tucker? Well, it's a big deal because uh, this is the expense. Well, first of all, the, because the digital world is increasingly the real world. A lot of people don't understand it. Actually, a lot of people, most people who talk about the subject, are pretty ignorant of it. Um, but d domain addresses and things like that are, you know, the real estate of, of our times. It's no different from, you know, the, the land rush in the 19th century when everybody was moving west, you know. What you homestead first, you get. And then, then a market develops. So if you want something, you have to, you have to figure out some way uh, to trade for it, you know, in a peaceful, um, nonviolent world. And... That's what you do. And so there is a gigantic market for domain names. I, I play in that market myself. You know, I'm always buying and selling addresses, and that's what, that's what uh, nice, peaceful uh, people do. Vince? Um, like, I can understand, but like, like the servers, like the, like, even like if it doesn't belong to the government, it's going to be, it's, somebody's going to own the servers, so... Like, all, all do you have, like, do you own a part of the server or do they license it to you? This is the thing, like, like I, I understand your, your point of view. It's just, like, I just wish I, that, you know, you, you could give me an enlightenment about that, you know, like, because if I own a server and I, I, like, how does it work? Like, do you have any idea how it works? Can you explain that to me? I mean, if you, have you ever played the, played, have you ever been in the market for domain addresses? Before? No, I never been. But like, okay. you know, like it, to me, like in my mind, I thought about you know, like um, video games or Facebook or something. Like when you have an account, you have to, you know, you, know, you agree to a license when you when you do that and when you sign up. Yeah, no, it's so, not a like, private it, license though. This is this is Icon. This is this is the UN. This is a government creation. So, um, I mean, yeah, it's a little funny. It's I mean, look, it's here, here's the the physical. The physical analogy is this: like I buy a home, and and then you, you look at the, the the plan of the home, and you see that uh, the state has has reserved, you know, part of that property of that you you've purchased, you know, in the event that the state wants it for some reason, like a road expansion or to put in uh, cables for 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 new telephones or internet or whatever, they can take your property. Um, you hope they don't, but they can take it. Um, but you you essentially have no choice in the matter. You want you want to buy the home, so it's it's not it's not a contract like a normal contract where I go to buy a gallon of milk and exchange for two dollars and fifty cents and take it home. I mean, these these rules that you're referring to are 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 forced on us because the the main domain registry agency enforcement agency is a is a government uh, thing now. Most people don't use uh, the options within these, what you're calling the licenses, uh, because it's just nasty. You know, it's nasty to, to, to take people's stuff, basically. You know, it's not a nice thing to, to go up to somebody's house and say, oh, well, by the way, state-based eminent, eminent domain isn't as terrible as outright stealing of domains, because at least you get just compensation. The other thing is that uh, imminent, like the imminent domain cases of the last decade that were, the, that were heard in the Supreme Court, um, some of them were, were decided against the government because um, the plaintiffs were able to demonstrate that uh, the land was taken or the property was taken not for public use, but for purely private purposes. So th what I'm saying is that, this, that any attempt to grab using ICON, you know, to grab somebody else's property 
uh, is in many ways worse than private than eminent domain as you see in the physical world because there is no just compensation and it is not for public purposes it's for purely private purposes do you see what I mean yeah, no I understand what you mean it's just like I try to imagine like how it would work without government like all the internet would work without government well, and, I know it would work just it would work pretty much the way it works now, except well, for Well, hold on, hold on, Vince. I heard this in your right. earlier question. I wanted to try to rephrase this to be a little more specific for yeah. Mr. Tucker. How could we possibly have respect for individual control of domains without some central authority like something empowered by the UN to prevent people from just going, "Oh, well, you created this URL. I'm going to create the same URL and hopefully half the people that you look for it will come to my site instead of yours that kind of actual double squatting or poaching of domain names that way how could you have that without a, a, a singular authority not necessarily a government one but how could you like or since we have that and that's how it's being done what's the free market alternative thank you Vince okay that, okay well the free market alternative is the free market and 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 if you look at things like uh, law of the seas uh, that that governed you know ships transporting goods between countries for the last 500 years that was entirely private law uh, uh, most everything that occurs in the world is a result of private private law and private agreements government actually has very little to do with it if the government had never been involved with uh, uh, this domain registration process at all it would work very uh, smoothly and, and thoroughly and in fact uh, ninety nine point nine percent or more of it works this way today I mean it, there's a really active and energetic market I mean there's domains that I want to buy right now and I'm in I've, I've got one domain that I've been in negotiations for 12 months to try to get get this domain and Which one is that? I, I, we haven't come to any agreement it's um, laissezfairebooks.com LF, LFB, uh, com. we don't own it mm -hmm. um, I mean, the last owners of LFB.com, you know, idiotically let it go, and some very clever entrepreneur, you know, swept in and and picked it up. Well, hey, you know, uh, good for them. That's that's smart entrepreneurship, you know. Well, now they've got it. Uh, they want more for it than I'm willing to pay. So, you know, we've been going on 12 months on this. It's fun. I I rather enjoy it. It's a it's a fun mm -hmm. and enjoyable marketplace. But, you know, I would never. <laughs> it never occurred to me uh, it would be unthinkable for laissez fair you know, to somehow assert its you know, ownership rights over this just because we have the, the name LFB. You know, I mean, it's just, I, 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 I mean, I must say that, that, that it would never have even crossed my mind to do that because these are real owners. I mean, the people that own LFB.com, it's kind of a Google bait site of sorts. Like a like like a lot of demands out there, but I wouldn't call it squatting. I mean, they've got a they've got a legitimate business. They get traffic from it and they get revenue from it. So uh, there would be no justification at all, I would think, for taking it from them using uh, government force. All right, Vince. Thanks so much for the call, Mr. Tucker. Appreciate it. It's all the time we have for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Jeffrey Tucker. The website. We do got a few questions for the time being. Oh, do we have some yeah, burning questions do. from the chat? All right, we'll make it real quick here. Don't want to cut anybody off from yeah. the chat. First question will be: uh, Will you follow Bloomberg on the soda ban? What? Oh, will he follow the soda ban? Yes, sir. Yes, <laughs> the soda ban. I'm in favor of massive drinking of humongous <laughs> sodas to the point of, you know, uh, obesity and death. Yeah, I think that's everybody's right. <laughs> That's how do you, how do you feel about Obama making uh, universal pre-K, and what's the purpose of another slave year? Will be the second question. Ooh, universal oh. pre-K. Yeah. What is that? Was that in the State of the Union last night? I I missed, if it, it was, I missed it. I, I caught it somewhere. It might have been State of the Union. I can't remember yeah, where no, I get he, all the names. He, he, I, I saw some clips of the State of the Union. He and he was like, you know, giving once again his agenda. It's like, I want, you know, how he had this crazy wish list of all the glorious things that would happen if we give him total power. You know, right? Tomorrow, all no money. Realistic, realistic you know, strategy then, on how he wants to go about that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's yeah. But that was one of like forty-five idiotic things he said. I mean, I was just so deeply embarrassed by that speech. I mean. Uh, the, the minimum wage stuff, which I wrote about today, I couldn't resist. I thought, yeah, I woke up when I heard about this stupid $9 minimum wage thing. I thought, okay, I'm not going to write about the minimum wage. Well, I couldn't help it, right? So I immediately pounded out an article about the minimum wage because it's just so evil and so rotten. 
you know, that he's promoting this crap, you know, in the name of helping people. This is a calamity. I mean, we've got massive youth unemployment. Uh, if this thing goes through, which maybe it probably won't, thank, thank goodness it, it probably won't. I and mean, there'll be millions of people unemployed and, and suffering more than they are now. But that was just like everything in that speech. Was there anything good? In it? I mean, I can't even. Yes, I only went through it very quickly. He did but. say at one point, nothing I've said tonight is of relevance, right? That was the one true thing that he said. <laughs> yeah, he was so blunt with a, it. A false, first, yeah. a false, there was one false note of humility that contained a strange truth. You know, I just, you know, and I'm, I, to tell you the truth, Adam, I'm not like the kind of person, I'm not like a, a classic Obama hater. You know, like there's, you know, like I think, I don't. I'm not a person inclined to just go around saying, oh, he's an evil dictator. You know, he's, he's. I'm not that way. I mean, I, I try to find things about him that are, you know, I, I try, to, nice person I try doing not that. to like him so much, but I, I'm just not like riled up against him, I guess. I, just say, I, I hate all presidents. Well, you, know? you understand him as a product of the paradigm, not as a, as, yeah. as, as, as more so than an individual actor. Yeah, yeah. But, but, the, but I must say that that speech really, really annoyed me, you know, just reading through it this morning. I didn't even watch it, but, uh, but that was just a gigantic pack of lies from, from beginning to end. And uh, I think it's just really pathetic that, you know he's as popular as he is. I mean, it's 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 outrageous. I mean, I'm not saying that like the Republicans have a better alternative, really. I mean, I, whoever that Republican guy that ran, it would probably have been worse. You know, I don't know. I, I how do you know these things? I don't know. But all I'm saying is that State of the Union address last night was was like uh, uh, a recipe for for absolute despotism. Uh, you know. Uh Thank you so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Jeffrey Tucker, the website for the time being for <laughs> Laissez Fair Books, lfb.org. You can see his article That's there, The Four Signs of a Collapsing State. Thank you so much for joining us. And then they call these arbitrary lines drawn on maps borders. Patriotism is a form of collectivism.